and uh, rain is coming is a blessing. So <laughs> I hope that <laughs> is, is the case. Um, the, the title of this panel is uh, Investigative Journalism. And uh, I'm very glad to have here two uh, very huge, big sample of African journalism in uh, Africa. And at, uh, um, at my side, at my right side, is uh, Ron McCullough, uh, which is founder and editor-in-chief of uh, uh, Insight, the uh, World Investigate. And at my uh, left side is uh, Sorius Samura, and is a director uh, of Insight, uh, the World Investigate. Um, my name is uh, Antonella Sinopoli, and uh, I'm the editor-in-chief of Voci Globali. I was thinking about the presentation of uh, my guests and uh, uh, that should have been much, much longer. And then I thought I will, uh, I will waste uh, time and that is better because I want you to understand from their own words the value of what they have been doing investigating in Africa and the contribution they are giving uh, to, to all of us to know better this continent. So what is uh, inside the word investigate, first of all? I would like Ron to start and tell us what is about, you are the founder, many, many years ago, why you decide to start this adventure and what is about and maybe about the team. Okay, I will add that last year, we had here Anas Aremayao Anas. That is uh, one of the most well-known uh, uh, investigative journalists in Africa. And we had the honor last, last year to have him here and Anas is one, uh, is part of the team. But please, can you tell us more about this? Sure. Um, um, insight. TWI, the World Investigate, um, is, is uh, the latest iteration of um, a company called, that started called, uh, as Insight News Television in 1991. And, um, and I, I used to work for the BBC um, for 10 years. And my sense working for the BBC was, whilst it was a great organisation to work for, we didn't have context, or enough context, in the stories that we were doing. And now it works. <laughs> <laughs> now it really starts. But I think you heard me before, yeah. didn't you? Good. So um, I, I, I had a, a bit of frustration in, in my journalism, and I wanted to do something that was deeper and more contextual. And for the first 10 years, we did news features, uh, many of them in Africa, as the normal white journalists, we call it parachuting into Africa and struggling to find out what was going on, but doing quite a good job, we thought, and selling our, our work to broadcasters around the world. And then in 2000, along comes this gentleman here, Sorius Samura, who, who turns up at a, a, an award in London called the Rory Peck Award with some extraordinary footage of, of a civil war in Sierra Leone. And I had never seen anything like it. Um, the, events, the event in, in London, you know, 300 suits of the industry. Um, everybody was there. It was London. It was the, so that we had all the foreign uh, bureaus there as well as the Beeb and Reuters, ITN, the whole crowd. And Sorius came on with the footage and everybody was quite stunned. And then he said, you know, if you guys had done your job properly and told the story of this civil war that was going on, then I wouldn't win this, I wouldn't have won this award. And I'm quite happy to give you the award back. Um, you know, if you could just do your job properly in Africa. At which point he walked off the stage to complete silence. And then it started. One person stood up and started clapping, and then the rest of them did. And 300 
suits in this business stood up and applauded their own incompetence. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I have never heard an African voice like this before. This is an extraordinary voice. And he was, a, at that stage, he was a cameraman. But as I say, the voice was, was even more extraordinary than this incredible footage. And so I went up to him afterwards and I said, look, I'd love to work with you. But I'll tell you what, go and see everybody else first because everybody will want your footage. But if you, don't, if you don't get from them what you're looking for, please come and see me. And, and to be honest, when I left the stage, I thought, well, obviously he's going to be offered a lot of money and, and he, he'll, he'll probably, that's the last I'll see of him. And then a week later, he came into my office with 18 hours of this material. And that was the beginning of the most important relationship of my career. And we've been working together ever since. So um, that led to a whole bunch of other things, but I'm gonna, if I may hand over to Samura, uh, that he can take us on the next leg. If yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, to be, just for the records, actually I was handed, uh, I was offered a lot of money um, by the major broadcasters, but um, before I talk about that, I just wanna do something completely different from what perhaps uh, you have been experiencing over the past day or two. I want to ask you guys, first of all, um, please just give me a wave if any of you here drink coffee. Tea? Wow. <laughs> That's the entire room. And you know when you drink that coffee or tea uh, to make it really to your uh, flavor, you put milk and sugar, and of course you enjoy that splendid cup of tea or coffee. But there's something that you perhaps don't notice when you drink that tea or coffee. Can anybody guess? It's what's at the bottom of the cup. Underneath, below that cup, is slavery. Underneath that cup is human abuse. At the bottom of that cup is child labor. But you enjoy the sweet beat, but you don't see what is underneath that cup. And that was the problem that I was facing and the Western media has been facing for years. How do we go in the, through the middle, even though we put the milk and the sugar, it's not clear enough, it's not bright enough. You can't see underneath because it's meant to be like that. And you want to tell these stories of these people in the developing world, particularly in Africa. You want to try and go through the milky, the cloudy bit so that you are able to see what's underneath. And the Western media has been trying that for years. Um, but they have failed to crack it because, as Ron said in the beginning, it's always been that parachute sort of journalism where they come in with that five-day rule. They fly in, they meet the powerful people, greet them, and ask them questions. And the next day, they perhaps go to victims. And maybe the third day, they go around getting their GVs. And the fourth day, they get one big interview. And the last day, they wrap up and they leave. And in my corner, I've been dying because I grew up in, in Sierra Leone, and I know what injustices meant, and I wanted those stories to be told, but I didn't have the medium or the platform. And fortunately, um, in 99, when I filmed the invasion of Freetown, I, I came in, and the BBC, AJ, um, no, the BBC, CNN, and... Um, uh, ITV, they all offered money, but I wanted to tell our own story because that has been the problem that we faced for years. Is and um, I mean, anyone with the uh, um, African um, um, experience will tell you that we have lots of these sayings, but we never put them in practice. But there is an African saying that um, until the lion tells its own story, the hunter will always be glorified. And the West 
has been the hunters, and they've been telling our story their own way, and we wanted to do this. So Ron, um, um, obviously, based on the few info I've had, um, I knew he was the person to help me tell the African story, to create that partnership. You know, ah, that's the word, partnership. And here we want to talk about respectable, decent partnership between African journalists and the West. And we've not had that for quite a while. Because if you want to go tell the story of the tea, the coffee, and the farmer in, in Africa is making huge money by exploiting these children, child labor, or the, the government that is making money from coffee and tea would not want you to tell that story. And you fly in and you talk to their people and what story do you get? But if you find the ordinary local fixer, you call him, some out here, what we call, these are our colleagues, journalists. Find the local journalist. They can tell you the story better. They can give you a balanced story. They can give you the side of that story that perhaps your five day visit to that country or two weeks, in fact, is not enough to tell that kind of story. So that was, that's clearly why I started with that coffee and tea. You want to tell that coffee and tea, you want it to be understood, you have to tell it from the bottom up. That's what has been missing. And so Ron and I created that sort of partnership and we started working together. And I also, during the early stages, if I may say, we fell into what I call the three Ds. You know, we were telling the three Ds about uh, my continent, death, disease, and disaster. And quickly, you know, we started thinking, you know what, if we really want to tell the stories in such a way that we can put them in context, we have to find our local colleagues as well, because these are not our stories. They are their stories. We have to create that sort of partnership, and that's how um, Africa investigate sort of the idea was born. We decided that we have to go back and find the local journalists, bring them together, and try to do what, because don't forget, there are lots of foundations. Can I go on? There are lots of foundations. There are organizations, whether it's the BBC, whether it's Ford Foundation. They're all funding journalism and trainings in Africa. But again, like I said, it is not enough to go do the one, two week training. You know, this, this has to be more than that. You know, they need this, they need the, uh, at least some heroes or people uh, 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 um, that they can follow. So we decided that first of all, um, we have to find this local um, journalist and give them what I have now been fortunate to have in the West, and that is the discipline, the training, the insurance, and get, getting paid well, um, so that at the end of the day, most importantly, the protection. Because when these, my colleagues, tell the stories, um, we know there are prices to pay. So we realize that if we are to organize a workshop um, and you know we you know two week or so workshop and find you know thorough investigative journalist and just help them with a bit of the discipline and give them the necessary assurance and insure them like we are being insured here in the West, maybe just maybe we'll start getting some balance reporting and we'll start getting the stories that because of uh, um, political correctness. Western journalists cannot tell. Because there are things that I can say about Africa, about Nigeria, Sierra Leone, uh, um, Kenya, Uganda, that you cannot say because we are also good at using reverse racism. So this has been the, the issues, and that's how we decided that we are going to get Africa Investigate. Um, I'll shut up now and say that's how it was born. <laughs> Uh, journalism is uh, uh, true journalism is also about the impact it has on the people, on the community. Um, one problem here is you made uh, dozens of video now and documentaries and films. Uh, they have been broadcasted <laughs> on uh, BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera. Uh, but what about 
the African media, because maybe this impact should be also on the African politics, African governments, African people. Is it uh, easy to, let's say, sell your job on African uh, media? It's a, it's a tough challenge. Um, you know, the interesting thing is that as journalists, you know, our speciality is the business of, uh, certainly the only training I had at the BBC was to learn how to tell stories. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what we do, all of us as journalists, just, just to be storytellers adapted to whichever medium we happen to find ourselves in. But when it comes to um, selling stories, uh, that, that's a whole new challenge, it's complete, obviously. And, and, and I suppose it's, it's more akin to being a freelance journalist. Uh, but in, in our company, it was easier, you know, you did the deals with BBCs, as you say, the Al Jazeera's, um, CNN. But when it came to dealing with African broadcasters, it was a nightmare. Because number one, well, there's 52 of them, uh, for a start. I mean, there's, at that stage, there wasn't a global African broadcaster as such. Um, now, since then, uh, there have been a number of players who've come on the scene, and we have done work with them because they're broadcasting, they're, they're like DSTV broadcast to the whole of Africa. Um, um, but when it came to individual broadcasters, the, because we do investigative journalism, and obviously for those of us who do investigative journalism realize you have to do. And um, when you put a script together and you, you cut this piece together, you have lawyers who will advise you how far you can go and no further. And then that piece becomes a locked piece, which cannot be edited, or else if it is edited, you lose your legal integrity and indemnity. And the problem we were having was that we couldn't get assurances from uh, any of the broadcasters that we were talking to in Africa, other than the bigger ones that were dealing with the whole continent, we could not be sure that they would broadcast without editing. So it wasn't even, the, I mean, the money wasn't an issue for us. We were quite happy to, to, to give in, in many cases. I don't personally, and, and indeed none of my senior team have ever felt that it's reasonable to give a piece away completely, but we'd sell it for $100. I and mean, there should be some value attached to it. And legally, there has to be for various reasons. Um, but anyway, that wasn't the issue. The issue was we could not be assured they wouldn't, they wouldn't change the editorial. Because some people do in, in, in these broadcasters. And, and frankly, they do it for political, for political reasons. And, and it, just, it just isn't acceptable. So for that reason, it was difficult to, to get it out to separate. Even in, even in, in, in countries like Sierra Leone, when that piece, and I was talking about it, where, where I met him with that m amazing footage. That footage got turned into a film called Cry Free Time. And Cry Free Time, I think without doubt, is probably the most important work we'll ever do, um, even though we've done loads since, uh, because it, it had such an impact. And uh, it did change the destiny of Sierra Leone. Uh, it had a remarkable impact to the United Nations in New York. It's a fascinating story. When the, it, was, it was due to be shown at the cinema in uh, the, the, the UN Plaza in New York on a Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock. And um, they put it out, um, it's a 30 minute film. And um, I then got a call from a friend of mine who was working at the press office at the UN New York. He says, he said, it's still running. I said, what do you mean it's still running? And it was like two hours later. I said, it's only a half hour film. He said, no, no, it's on its third run. There's people queuing up to watch it. And he said, they're still queuing. And they kept it running for three days. And uh, it turned out that we, Obviously, people had heard about it. They wanted to see more of it. But the strange thing was there was a load of people in the United Nations at very senior levels who were already very, very much aware of what was going on in Sierra Leone and had been for years. ECOMOG, which is the uh, military wing of the ECOWAS, the, uh, it's like the European community of West Africa, you see, the West African Economic Community. And they had a, a military force. And, and, that, and that force was doing some pretty, pretty terrible things, frankly in Sierra Leone, and, and they knew about it at the UN. I knew they knew about it. I'd spoken to senior players at the UN. Um, but the thing was, they knew about it, but nobody else was asking them about it. Nobody else was raising the issue. And this film left nobody in any doubt what was really happening. 
and within two weeks, the Security Council uh, decided to send the largest UN force in history uh, to that point, uh, to, to, to Sierra Leone. And, and it wasn't as if we told them something they didn't know, but we'd made it public. It was out there. It was on CNN. It was global. It was in the Herald Tribune. It was everywhere. And at that point, they were embarrassed into doing something, and they did. And they sent in a large UN force, and two years later, there were democratic elections. So, uh, and by the way, I, I hear some journalists say to me, Ron, you know, don't, don't, don't get this idea into your head, please, that journalism somehow makes a difference. We're not here to make a difference. We're here to be journalists and, you know, whatever. If it makes a difference, so be it. Well, actually, in Africa, it's more important than that. It really matters. And, and, and holding, holding power to account is what drives us and drives Africa Investigates and drives all of the investigative journalists that we work with. I just want can I just add, I mean, uh, Ron didn't touch on another very crucial point um, about why these films are difficult to uh, be shown in, in, in Africa. Uh, the media, uh, almost across all of Africa is controlled by the government of the day. And uh, therefore, uh, if it's anything that is gonna question um, that government, you, 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 you bet, uh, you know, it's not even the Ministry of Information or the President. We talk about self-censorship, it is in Africa that it is the norm because uh, the, the, the whether it's the um, director <coughs> general or the program uh, 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 um, director, he has a job to protect. And so he, he says for himself, he looks at the film and, and it is, it sometimes it's like a joke. I've had, you know, they've shown like my living with series, living with hunger, living with this in my country, Sierra Leone. And then uh, we, you know, I said to them, there was a film I did about timber in which uh, we went undercover and and um, we caught uh, the vice president's team in sort of deals and stuff like that and it was, it had a huge impact in the country, everyone was talking about it. So they decided, to, they, run, they were running all my other films at the time, so I, I offered this, I said, don't worry, you don't even have to pay. And the guy looked at me and said, you know, you will be flying soon to um, London, me, my family, they're all here. Are you not? Are you crazy? Well, that's what, that's the harsh reality of what our colleagues have to deal with. Sometimes when we go and we do the stories, they are very strong, they are very powerful. And of course, even if it's one person that our story can help change a situation, well, that's what that one person has been living for, for a voice, for somebody um, that will actually help to uh, 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 make a difference uh, or make the important uh, uh, interesting in their lives. So sometimes people are waiting for that opportunity, but the, the, even if you give some of these films and the type of films that we do, you give it to these guys for free, they will not show them because it's not just uh, them. It's their family, it's their relatives, it's friends who will get into trouble. And this just brings me quickly to, okay, maybe you'll go there, so okay. I'll let you. Let me, let me ask you this, because uh, you know, Africa is not only about war, famine, disasters. And as journalism is not only about telling stories, but it's also about ethics. It's also about common people. And, uh, you know, very often it happens that uh, Western journalists, Western media go to Africa, they shoot videos, they do, um, uh, uh, they meet people, interview them, and take pictures and all this stuff. They, they, then they fly and the people remain there. And these people are never involved uh, in the, uh, they, they don't know what happened then. Uh, but what I like, you, you were telling me something so important that I really would like to uh, you repeat about involve the people, let them understand that their story really matters. So can you tell us about how many times you fly again to the place after the job was done. 
after the documentaries was ready, to let them know, you make this. It's because of you I made this, and you will see it. You see, there's no doubt, uh, I'm sure we all in this room will agree that, um, you know, journalism is power, power in our hands, power on the pen, power on our laptops. But that power that we have, we have to handle it responsibly. Um, growing up in Sierra Leone, uh, I, 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 I used to have that anger, like many other fellow Africans, or Sierra Leoneans to be precise, when people come, take our pictures, um, and we know nothing. <laughs> we don't know what they're going to do with them. And, um, you know, sometimes they come and film and they leave. And I can tell you today that that attitude created, if some of, some, to be precise, this is not racism, but if some white Western journalist has faced um, hostility in some African countries, these are the reasons. Because it got to a stage where the clever uh, politicians in the middle um, who didn't want the news or reports to come out and the, uh, and, and the Western journalists come and film and they know that these people are not going to see it, they just play on that and say, eh, these white people, they just come in here to take your picture and they go sell them and they do this. And so that somehow became that angry force in between. So when Western journalists, quite a lot of anyone who's experienced this, these have been the reason. So when we had this opportunity, uh, um, you know, these are uh, conversations we've had in many quarters and, uh, 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 before we got to the stage, you know, saying it has to change. These are not our stories. Why do we do these stories? We do these stories. We try to, 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 to inform these people, if it, whether it's about their elections, you inform the electorates so that they can form informed opinions. We guide these people so that we can empower them so that they actually will be able to make the right calls or the right decisions. But if this work that we do is meant to be the mirror for these people, that they are meant to see themselves and understand their mistakes and understand the things that they are not doing so right, yet we don't ever get to project it for them so that they see it themselves, then actually who are you targeting? Why are you doing this? You know, so that was what we started thinking about. So when we go out, and because I have experienced this over the years, when I had the opportunity to start making these films uh, some 16, 17 years ago, the first thing we agreed on is that these people whose story we tell have got to see these stories. So, for instance, we'd made Living with AIDS in Zambia, and the government didn't want the people to see the story. We actually teamed up with UNAIDS, and we went there, and we went to ports, to small ghettos and stuff like that, to get people to see. You know, we, 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 we made uh, uh, in uh, Ethiopia, in La Libella, we actually bought uh, uh, or we hired generators and got people to see the films, so they understand. Um, but it is more than that. These people whose story we tell, um, we leave, we come to our comfortable homes with our families, what happens to them? So in trying to make sure that their interest is also pro protected, because it's not just about the story, because some of these people, you interview them, they give answers that is perhaps going to get a government official thinking, damn, we're coming for you. Um, we make sure that, um, first of all, before we even go ahead and show our films. We actually get, if, if we need a translator, we get the translator and the person, no matter where they are, we are all online discussing and asking you, this is what you said, this is what we're gonna cut, are you happy for us to use it, apart from the consent form that will make them sign? Because for me, this is not just a film, it's not just journalism. These are a people that we have to care for. This is what journalism is all about. It's not all about just doing the story and the story goes away. No, we keep following up. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have a, one or two videos, very short one. Uh, 
just to show you some example, I'm, I'm very sure that uh, we, you will go yourself then to, to, to look for the others one because all of them are very, very interesting. And uh, maybe we can uh, start with the first uh, um, short video and then we will tell what it's about. <clears throat> oh. Bear with me. We are coming. <laughs> we are getting there. <laughs> <laughs> This story, for example, was broadcasted on uh, Al Jazeera <coughs> as a very sensitive issue in, uh, in Africa, in all Africa, not only in this country. You were in Nigeria, I think. It's not the abortion one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult um, viewing because this is something that is happening to lots of women across. Africa and their story doesn't see the light of day in many, many parts. And uh, we, we took it on with um, a couple of our colleagues who also uh, spent time uh, during the African investigative workshop. And of course, Anas was on board as well, uh, just to bring out this very, very challenging issue for women in Africa. Mrs. Obo entices guests to call for abortions done by her husband in the filthy back room of his beer parlor. I've had many stories of guests suffering or dying from botch abortions at the hands of quacks. I want to expose these criminals and bring them to justice. Aigbe Ogboro has a reputation of aborting even in advanced stages of pregnancy, but he is not a real doctor. I hate doing this, but these ruthless men keep getting away with it. I know I'm not pregnant, but without even doing a pregnancy test, I was shocked he was ready to carry out an abortion on the spot. So, if I, if I charge you, I will charge you to be we tell him that we will return tomorrow for the abortion. We took our evidence to the police, providing nobody tips him off. We will be back with the full force of the law. Unsafe abortions are Africa's dark, dirty secret. I want to shed light on this tragedy because so many women often have no choice but to risk their lives at the hands of the quack abortionist. Every year in my country, tens of thousands of them will die. It's time for my abortion by Mr. and Mrs. Oboru. The police take up station outside the clinic. Inside, she leads us to her husband's filthy operating room. My heart is pounding. I'm moments away from the operation. He prepares the operating room. I'm so scared. Thank God the police get here on time. The fake doctor protests as the plainclothes police officer takes him away. I often ask myself how these squads can live with themselves. At the police station, unbeknownst to them, there is a bigger shock in store. This woman, Juliet, had a botched abortion by Aigbe Ogboru that almost killed her. This man bust a womb. Very, very heartless. No, say get children. Now you too. You go very, very heartless. Because then you said your husband. Shut up. I mean, go shut up. You feel not consigned. And I see they pay the money. Uh, I can imagine how many challenges and uh, problems you can meet to shoot these videos and uh, you know to prepare it. If I don't know which one I want to explain how it was me. Okay. And, uh, um, oh. Well, that was Rosemary um, working with our colleague Anas. Um, Rosemary came to us. We we have a the way we work is 
we invite investigative journalists um, to come to us and we send out through all sorts of um, through newspapers and through um, agencies and through um, trade organizations, journalism forums, we spend about two months sending the message out. We're, we're looking for investigative journalists in Africa. We've got a new series coming up. We've got six films to make. We need to find stories. Come to us with your stories. We send them to a website, which is um, usually uh, insighttwi.com. And on that site, even today, there's a place for journalists to go. And we, we, put, we, we ask them to give us um, the, the information on their stories uh, to, into an encrypted um, Dropbox. Um, and we guarantee that we will not do anything with these stories other than assess them for, um, for our series. And if we don't, we don't go anywhere with it, then we don't, the story is theirs, we don't touch it. And then uh, we make a selection from those suggestions that we get. And um, we usually choose about 12 journalists to come on a two-week, um, what we call commissioning and development uh, um, course, um, and, and to which our commissioner uh, usually comes uh, from the broadcaster. And um, we intensely um, interrogate the stories. And we work out exactly what each of these individuals who come to us with these stories have got, how strong their story is, what evidence they have, and we, you know, rigorously check this. And you know, on our team, Sorius and Anas, as well, and they often lead these conversations. And um, and through this process, we we find six films, six, uh, and sometimes Anas and Sorius will 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 do a film each. So maybe there's four left, and of those four, you know, um, Rosemary was one. <coughs> extraordinary story she wanted to tell. She wanted to, to, to actually go through um, as close as you could without actually um, um, being injured. It'd go through an abortion um, to the point at which we had the evidence necessary to get the arrest. And uh, it's dramatic, it's powerful, and it makes a difference. I mean, the guy's arrested, and, uh, and obviously a message is sent out that um, this is going on for a start, that you must be aware. Um, that this is happening. Uh, obviously, it was is you know you raised the point. It's a very important point. How would the local audience get to see this? And the answer is, there are actually DVDs of the film around. Um, it wasn't shown on Nigerian television or any TV station in Nigeria, but it was shown on Al Jazeera English, which is actually very widely watched in Africa, but albeit by the socio-economic group that can afford satellite dishes, which is not a large group. Mm -hmm. Look, I just want to add that um, when it comes to the coverage of Africa, it is clear that uh, um, you know you do have a lot of countries now, uh, African governments, who are telling you clearly um, that they don't have problems with press freedom. Um, and we all know that that's bullshitting. It's one of two things. It's either you have uh, the clamping down on the press. The way it operates, it's, 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 it's simple. In some countries, whether it's Ethiopia, we know some of those countries, it's either they serious clamp down on the media and they don't hide it at all, or the countries that you hear government say, oh, we don't have problem with press, no, and I, I know some of those countries, you just buy the journalist over. And so you watch some of these African countries and out here, our colleagues are saying, what are they complaining? You know, look at the country. No journalist has been arrested for one, two years. I mean, why are our colleagues complaining? All you have to do is put them in your pocket. So that's the challenge. So for us to actually find colleagues in Africa, in a country where it's either they are always um, um, in the queue to go um, into prison or they have sold out. It's difficult. So we have to do a thorough job to actually assess because it's so difficult for some of these stories to be done now through open filming. So you could see that most of what we do, um, it's undercover, except that in the end we'll fly in and actually wrap up the story. But we have to 
During these two weeks, we have to actually train these people how to use secret cameras. We have to train them on the legals because in Africa, I swear to God, they have very good lawyers. So you have to work on prima facie evidence to make sure that, you know what, first of all, we have a reason to do this story because we've proved that this thing has been going on. You have to teach them on that. You have to teach them on the skills. Well, not teach, these are our colleagues. You've got to share the skills. You've got to make sure that also you think about their health and safety. So all of these we do during this two weeks course together and then they go out then they get they get all these sort of stories when he came when she came to us with this story she didn't want to do the story she want, wanted us to do the story but she front the story because she is afraid she's scared of her life and, and her family but we thank God because we also, I mean, we've created a brand that once these stories are out, and this is what local journalists need the most, you know, to have the sort of platform that some of us have. Because when these stories are out on, like Al Jazeera, CNN, BBC, some of these big names, these bad guys think twice. So thank God um, nothing has happened to Rosemary, but her story, actually for quite a while, um, we did use um, Anas's mantra, which is name, shame, and jail. Uh, thank you very much. We don't, we don't have uh, too much time left, but I really would like to touch a couple of points and uh, give some few minutes to the audience. I'm sure that there are some questions. Um, one is about, uh, um, I mean, what I appreciate very much every time I, I watch these videos with these documentaries is that um, you go there, for example, Sierra Leone, it's your own country. You could go there and you uh, could do your own job by yourself. But uh, you didn't. You work in partnership, like here, with a local journalist, and not as a fixer, but as a colleague. Yes. This is something that never happened, never happened to Western journalists, first of all. I will not give you the chance to answer because there is no time, but I, I really wanted to, um, to point out this yeah. point. And uh, another is, uh, we don't want to be politically correct. So, we can uh, speak openly about a problem. And the problem is that I really would like one day to see, to read on an Italian newspaper a, a story about Africa, a covering about Africa, written by a correspondent, an African correspondent, hmm? and not written on desk or something like that. So if we have two articles, one on the same story, one written by a Western uh, journalist, white journalist, I want to know, to use this uh, uh, adjective. Uh, the same story, who, maybe this journalist never went to that country, or just as a parachute uh, journalist. And the same story written by an uh, African journalist. Uh, the audience maybe will believe the story written by the white journalist. So please, I don't want to ask you this because we don't want to be politically correct. You are a veteran journalist from BBC. So can we talk about, can you use, use the word racism and journalism? Well, Soros already used this expression reverse racism. And there is absolutely no doubt that um, we are often, as white European correspondents in Africa, we're reverse racists. We, we, we are kinder to bad people than we ought to be because of the color of their skin. We will not say that this person is as bad as we would say they were if they were white and European, because we are afraid of being labeled racist. It's a fact, and it is, it's a great inhibitor. 
not only to journalism, but it does a great disservice to Africa. Because obviously, one of the great things about the fourth estate is that it holds power to account. And when you hold power to account, you know, there's a reason for doing it. You are there to, to do that so that that power will stop behaving badly. And if you don't hold power to account, uh, then bad things will continue happening. It's also a terrible example to set your African colleagues. Um, but it, it's a matter of fact that it was a revelation to me and to my team, and we all thought ourselves, you know, decent journalists. But it was a revelation to our team when Sarius would be quite so rude to his African colleagues and his, 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 his African seniors. I mean, he would ask them questions that we were going, God dear, really? Um, and yet he was asking questions that we responsibly would ask of our own leaders. It's a strange thing. It's a cultural thing. It's, it's, I call it a goldfish bowl. And we, we, we eventually saw that we, we, were, we had a goldfish bowl, as it were, around us and have, have gone a long way to go in the opposite direction. Um, can, can, I know you, you I just said seven words. Yeah, you, you have to look at her, not at me. Okay. For me, I can stay here okay. one hour more. <laughs> okay, but, okay. but the first question that you asked, I'll say three words to it as an answer. Um, for those of us who work with African journalists, I'll just say, respect your colleagues. That's to that first question about the journalist that we call fixer. But the, to the second one, um, it's good and I love it. And I will say, it's time we make foreign correspondents foreign. Exactly. Uh, if we have a really, really three, three minutes, um, the, the narrative about Africa is full, full of commonplace and prejudices. We have here some videos who really show uh, this, uh, this, uh, this problem. And, uh, um, and it's also a very sad story. I don't want to anticipate because we don't have time. If we want to show this video, a very Do short... we have time? We, we have time, just is three minutes time. Yep. Yeah. 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 Can we go? No. Okay. Good. Okay, time Understood. for questions? No. Oh, okay. So thank Our you. Session. Very... Our session started late. <laughs> no, we started late, but it's okay. But we started late, just five minutes. Okay. One minute, sir. Okay. One minute to wrap up. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank One you for being up. here. Let's let's do it this way. If you want to ask something to our guests, they will be um, uh, happy to answer for sure. And uh, I don't know if one of you want to answer. I don't want to take. Well, I just, just if I may say one final word, and that is, you know, I never thought it possible that we could actually make all this happen. I never thought it possible to actually reach out, talk with journalists in Africa, get them involved in actually making films and have those films shown around the world. I mean, to me, that's, I mean, if you'd said that to me 15, 20 years ago, I would have said that, that I don't think that can be done, and certainly not by us. And the truth is, one step at a time. So anybody, anybody here who, who does have um, any dreams about making a difference, keep on holding on. I just want to add that, um, um, you know, especially for African journalists, that we are not just um, doing the stories that I started with in the beginning, saying it's the three Ds, death, disease, and disaster. We are also trying to make stories that will change the narrative of Africa, stories that will offer hope, stories that will make um, Africans uh, um, also their, their mentality change and see themselves in a different light. So it's not just about um, the, 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 the stories that we, the Western media is telling us that this is what their viewers want to see. So if you do, um, and those of us who go to work in Africa, just believe that Africans also want the narrative change. So let's think about the stories that we tell about the continent. Thank you very much. The very, very last thing uh, um, for the one of you who are interested in Africa. Tomorrow we have another panel at, uh, is at uh, 4 p.m. at uh, Centro Servizi Alessi. It's about uh, uh, journalism as activism, an example from Africa, of course. So uh, I'm waiting for you there tomorrow. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>
<laughs> I look at you, it's now that he's given it to me. <laughs> Yes, um, what we'll do, uh, I'll give you my, um, uh, if you drop an email, we will uh, arrange, because we normally um, send those videos out and stuff, so, I give you, you know, so yes, we can arrange it, but you can look and see the different themes on the inter on our website. You, we can see them. Yes, yes, yes. But not the whole thing, not the entire thing, but it give you a sense of what. Um no better this continent. So, what is uh, inside the word investigate? First of all, I would like Ron to start and tell us what is about. You are the founder. Many, many years ago, why you decide to start this adventure and what is about and maybe about the team okay i will add that last year we had here anas aremayao anas that is uh, one of the most well-known uh, uh, investigative journalists in africa and we had the honor last last year to have him here and anas is one uh, is part of the team but please can you tell us more about this sure. Um, um, inside uh, TWI, the World Investigate, um, is, is uh, the latest iteration of um, a company called, that started called, uh, as Insight News Television in 1991. And, um, and I, I used to work for the BBC um, for 10 years. And my sense working for the BBC was, whilst it was a great organisation to work for, we didn't have context or enough context in the stories that we were doing. <laughs> and now it works. <laughs> now it really starts. But I think you heard me before, yeah. didn't you? Good. So um, I, I, I had a bit of frustration in, in my journalism and I wanted to do something that was deeper and more contextual. And for the first 10 years, we did news features, uh, many of them in Africa as the normal white journalists, we call it parachuting into Africa and struggling to find out what was going on, but doing quite a good job, we thought, and selling our, our work to broadcasters around the world. And then in 2000, along comes this gentleman here, Soyuz Samura, who, who turns up at a, a, an award in London called the Rory Peck Award with some extraordinary footage of, of a civil war in Sierra Leone. And I had never seen anything like it. Um, the, events, the event in, in London, you know, 300 suits of the industry. Um, everybody was there. It was London. It was the, so that we had all the foreign uh, bureaus there as well as the Beeb and Reuters, ITN, the whole crowd. And Sorius came on with the footage and everybody was quite stunned. And then he said, you know, if you guys had done your job properly and told the story of this civil war that was going on, then I wouldn't win this, I wouldn't have won this award. And I'm quite happy to give you the award back. Um, you know, if you could just do your job properly in Africa. At which point he walked off the stage to complete silence. Experiencing over the past day or two. I want to ask you guys, first of all, um, please just give me a wave if any of you here drink coffee. Tea? Wow. <laughs> That's the entire room. And you know when you drink that coffee or tea uh, to make it really to your uh, fa flavor, you put milk and sugar, and of course you enjoy that splendid cup of tea or coffee. But there's something that you perhaps don't notice when you drink that tea or coffee. Can anybody guess? It's what's at the bottom of the cup. Underneath, below that cup, is slavery. Underneath that cup is human abuse. At the bottom of that cup 
is child labor. But you enjoy the sweet beat, but you don't see what is underneath that cup. And that was the problem that I was facing and the Western media has been facing for years. How do we go in the, through the middle, even though we put the milk and the sugar, it's not clear enough, it's not bright enough. You can't see underneath because it's meant to be like that. And you want to tell these stories of these people. And uh, rain is coming, is a blessing. So <laughs> I hope that <laughs> is, is the case. Um, the, the title of this panel is uh, Investigative Journalism. And uh, I'm very glad to have here two uh, very huge, big samples of African journalism in uh, Africa. And at, uh, um, at my side, at my right side, is uh, Ron McCullough, uh, which is founder and editor-in-chief of uh, uh, Insight, the uh, word Investigate. And at my uh, left side, is uh, Sorius Samura, and is a director uh, of Insight, uh, the word Investigate. Um, my name is uh, Antonella Sinopoli, and uh, I'm the editor-in-chief of Voci Globali. I was uh, thinking about the presentation of uh, my guests, and uh, uh, that should have been much, much longer, and then I thought, I will, uh, I will waste uh, time, and that is better, because uh, I want you to understand from their own words the value of what they have been doing, investigating in Africa, and the contribution they are giving uh, to, to all of us. And then it started. One person stood up and started clapping, and then the rest of them did. And 300 suits in this business stood up and applauded their own incompetence. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I have never heard an African voice like this before. This is an extraordinary voice. And he was, a, at that stage, he was a cameraman. But as I say, the voice was, was even more extraordinary than this incredible footage. And so, I went up to him afterwards and I said, look, I'd love to work with you, but I'll tell you what, go and see everybody else first because everybody will want your footage. But if you, don't, if you don't get from them what you're looking for, please come and see me. And, and to be honest, when I left the stage, I thought, well, obviously he's going to be offered a lot of money and, and he, he'll, he'll probably, that's the last I'll see of him. And then a week later, he came into my office with 18 hours of this material and that was the beginning of the most important relationship of my career. And we've been working together ever since. So um, that led to a whole bunch of other things, but I'm gonna, if I may hand over to Samura, uh, that he can take us on the next leg. If yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, hey, good afternoon. Uh, to be, just for the records, actually I was handed, uh, I was offered a lot of money um, by the major broadcasters. But um, before I talk about that, I just wanna do something completely different from what perhaps uh, you have been 